Hi, I am Dr. Jessica Ware, and I currently serve as the president of the Entomological Society of America. Hi, I'm Dr. Mariana Lean, and I am the vice president of the Entomological Society of America. I'm Jennifer Hinky, and I am the vice president elect of the Entomological Society of America. I'm Michelle Smith, immediate past president of ESA. I am Dr. Priya Chakravarti Basu, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Early Career Professionals Committee of the Entomological Society of America. Welcome, ladies, and welcome, leaders, to our today's session. And this is so inspiring and exciting for all of us. March is Women's History Month, and this year, we have, for the first time ever, four women in ESA's presidential lineup. And I welcome you all on behalf of the ESA committee. And uh, today we are just going to go into a little bit of, uh, you know, discussion and informal chat about what life as an entomologist, as a woman, and as a leader is all about. So uh, I, I, you know, I've always been amazed at how women can can do so many things at the same time. We have homes, we have families, we have jobs, we have careers. And then we are also, when we are in the leadership role, uh, we, it's like we are always multitasking and we are doing it so well. But, but just kind of coming back, you know, yes, I, I see that. I mean, I, I know for sure. Yeah, like, hmm. <laughs> I'm confident I'm doing it well and other people think otherwise. <laughs> but... Uh, just kind of, uh, you know, starting off as entomologists, um, when, when, did, when did you decide that you wanted to pursue entomology and, and did folks at home take it well? Your family, friends, teachers, were they like, oh, she's studying bugs or were they like, wow, she's studying bugs? For me, um, I have to say that my mom was a really big influence um, and basically not, not because she knew what entomology was or encouraged me to be an entomologist, but because she always um, was very open to me dealing with critters, right? And um, being out in the yard, bringing in whatever I could find, looking at it, rearing it for a little while. And so she was so tolerant of that. Um, she loved nature herself. And so I think from the very, very beginning, I would have to say my mom was a big influence, um, a big influence on my love of nature and um, uh, ultimately of insects. That's special. Oh, sorry. I was just going to agree with, with Michelle. Um, similarly, my grandmother, uh, my nana, uh, and my granddad, they were nature lovers. And so they were used to us kind of here, here's a frog and here's a snake and here's a you know handful of crickets that we have. Um, and they really inspired us to ask a lot of questions um, and to be curious. So I think that's a real gift uh, that they gave to us, my, my twin and I. I, uh, I actually have the opposite. Like, I'm not that my, my parents discouraged me or my, or my grandparents, but I did not care about insects, uh, really. So uh, quite the opposite. So it was not until the end of undergrad when I realized, hey, I actually don't want to study medicine, um, that I realized I really do like parasitology. And uh, fortuitously, I, I actually met somebody who worked on that, Nancy Beckett. She became my advisor for my master's. And it was her that, that, like, that then showed me, oh, insects are great models for this because I also knew I don't didn't want to work with blood like actual humans and blood so uh the, you know insects are great they're great models and I've, over the years now I've appre come to appreciate insects a lot I'd say my experience is a, a lot more like M's um I was fortunate that my parents encouraged me to be a scientist um and so I I had you know every uh, kind of kit that you might want as a, a kid growing up. Those were available to me to, to play with all sorts of things. But I came to entomology pretty late as far as a, a college career. Um, it was my last year of undergrad and I, I wanted to move from being uh, studying genetics and human genetics to studying ecology. 
And I ended up working in uh, Art Benke's lab at the University of Alabama my last year and got interested in stream insects and um, then kind of moved my career from, from that uh, forward. So like Jennifer and M, the idea of entomology as a career opportunity and um, as, a, as a distinct science really for me resulted from my senior year in undergrad and my major professor being an entomologist by training. Um, and my senior honors project was working on insects and uh, after that, yeah, I was just really, really intrigued and charmed and uh, very excited to continue my pursuit then of entomology. Same for me, if it wasn't for Karen Needham and Jeff Scudder at UBC, you know, giving me a, a work study position um, in the Spencer Entomological Collection, uh, I probably would never have really found entomology, even though I liked nature. I didn't know that that was a position. And I really had only kind of heard of pest management. I didn't re really know very much about the systematics or evolutionary biology side of entomology. So they introduced uh, me to that. And that was um, kind of what led me on this the path, I suppose. It is amazing to see how uh, you know your careers have been shaped over the years, and and I'm, we are just curious: Have you faced any challenges uh, in in your career so far? You know, it could be while you were pursuing your degree, when or when you started your new jobs, or just like where you are now, especially as a woman. You know, trying to balance work and life as well as your leadership roles. Uh, what what are the challenges that you face? Um, I can. Uh, so for me, it, it was, uh, I guess, also early on that I am an immigrant, and um, so I, I did not did not know anything about the U.S. educational system or any careers. Even though, you know, like Michelle said too, like to not know that entomology can be a career uh, until very late. Um, uh, so language, not being able to understand the educational system and then also being first generation so mm -hmm. yeah um and yeah and then and i'm sure some of the other people will comment to this too is yes the work-life balance is, is always difficult um and uh, you know with children uh, especially but, yeah. does it does it make it even more difficult when you have a leadership role and you have a lot more responsibility in addition to what you're doing I guess, <laughs> but I mean, it's the one thing I really, well, not the one thing, it's one of the things I really like. So it, that's, you know, it's a trade-off. You know, I've, I have um, always wondered what is just uh, my personal nature and what is, you know, uh, common across, across genders, but um, I'll tell a little story that at a time when my kids were real small, um, I was really struggling with uh, a position where I was traveling quite a bit. And at that time, also my partner was uh, also traveling a lot and it was creating a very difficult situation. Um, I think self-imposed, I, I felt like I needed to do everything equally well and um, be a full-time mom and a full-time employee and uh, a full-time partner, right? And that's impossible. <laughs> you can't do that. And so I stopped working for a little while. Um, I, was, I was off work for about six months and uh, focused on my family. And what I, I was able to come back um, really quickly. I uh, was recruited back um, into a, a, a really good role for me at the time. But what I realized during that time was trying to balance everything really is hard and I needed to be a lot kinder to myself. <laughs> and so, you know, that uh, probably I, sh I didn't need to quit work for six months to learn that, but maybe I'm just slow that way and realized that, um, that I could be kind to myself, um, give a little bit and uh, be successful at both without being perfect all the time. I think that's a great advice. We, we often tend to have such high expectations out for ourselves uh, or, or we assume that people have those high expectations and we need to yes. always outperform, but, but that's not always the case. 
Similarly, when I, uh, I got, I was married uh, for a very long time, for 15 years, and then I got divorced and I, my kids were pretty young. And the best part, the reason why people go into CCB or systematics is because you get to travel because you get to do field work. That's what everybody loves about it. But I couldn't because I had young kids and it was really hard to find childcare. So like Michelle, it was, uh, you know, this, um, you know, this worry that I was abandoning these young children, but I had to go because it's my career. My whole job is doing field biology. It was a real uh, sticky point uh, and it's hard to know what the right decision is. But one thing that I, I found is that we all tend to work pretty hard. I mean, mo I don't know anybody that really isn't working hard. Everybody's working hard. So you actually accumulate a bunch of work. And then that if you do need to take some time um, where you do less work, it's probably mm -hmm. okay because you've probably been working this whole time. But we don't have to be going 100% all the time. Like you do 100% sometimes, mm -hmm. but then you can do 60% because you did 100% for so long, you know, and, and mm -hmm. kind of realizing that, that I actually had a bunch of work that I could just kind of coast for a little bit uh, when things were tough um, and then get back to it. That was, ooh, that was a good eye opener, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think like Michelle, I sometimes wonder what's common to um, pe all people and what am I experiencing that, that maybe is because of who I am or, or the experiences that I bring to the table. So thinking of my career, when I was hired at my mosquito control district, it was a new position um, and I was being brought in to deal with environmental permits that we hadn't had before as a district. And I was brought in as a peer to two men who had very defined roles as to what was successful for them. What did success look like? What would, would they know that was at the end of the year, you've done a good job and you can keep going. And I started thinking through, I said, well, if I'm really successful at the job that you brought me in for, I'm trying to get rid of my job because I'm trying to get rid of these permits and a lot of burden that we're currently doing. And then I don't really know what success looks like for me because we haven't had somebody in my role. So I sat down and asked my, my manager what his thoughts were. Um, and he un unfortunately told me, well, we haven't had anybody successful in your role before, so I don't know. And so that was very, you know, inside, like I cringed and I'm like, oh my, my gosh, I don't know what to do. Um, but I had, I had fortunately gotten some advice that maybe I should think some more about it. And I, I did, I, I told him that I, I wanted to think some more and I'd come back the next month. Um, my two peers were fantastic. They were very open with me about what their job was and what made them, you know, know that they had done a good job. And I asked them, well, what did they think they weren't getting done? Mm. And that was a, a really hard question for all of us to sit with for a period of time. But it, it may, meant that I could come back and continue to point out like, hey, here's a hole that I can, I can work in and I can make our program better. Um, but I needed them to also be vulnerable in that time to say like they weren't doing it all either, that there were pieces of their jobs that, that I could help with. Um, and I think that was a, a place where there were some hard conversations when I started because I'm the new kid um, trying to, to find my way, but also trying to, trying to make our program better. I think these are all great advice because sometimes in, in the ECP committee, these are some of the questions that our members ask us like, hey, how are you balancing work life? Like, what is expected of us? Are we not doing enough? But I think that there is a realistic a threshold for expectations that we should all understand and appreciate. Uh, the kind of, uh, along that similar thought, you know, being a woman has some great advantages, but do you, have you ever faced any disadvantages? What about say in, in a lab or in a classroom or, or in an office meeting? You're the only woman with a different voice of opinion. Has, has that ever happened to you? I see her. Yeah. Has it ever not happened? <laughs> I can't imagine any of us having been in a meeting where we where we I can't imagine that not having had happened. If that and if I conjugate that right, where at, at some point in our career you're always going to be the only one in the room at some point, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, I yeah, I, but I'm at a a very unusual entomology department, right? We have a we've always had a since I've been here, a female chair at Illinois and a department head. Um, so I really was struggling to find a time, like a where I 
where I felt, yes, I've been the only woman in the room, but where I felt that I was uh, being, um, you know, my contribution was lessened because I've been incredibly fortunate with my, um, the allies and the women who are role models. So. But I'm also a white woman. So from a Western European country. I would say I've been really fortunate to in, in my professional life, um, especially in employment, uh, even when I was the only female in the room, um, I've always felt like my opinions were respected. And um, the, the cha I guess the challenge for me has just been to, to um, if I'm, traveling or in the field or that those situations are a little more difficult um, it um, to just be a lone female um, working in the field sometimes in an isolated location uh, sometimes that can be a little um, unnerving I've never had a problem but it's always an awareness right you're always thinking aware of security and um, just making sure that you're safe uh, and I will say, you know, there have been situations where I maybe learned early that this particular um, uh, collaborator or customer, I didn't necessarily want to be at dinner alone with, or, you know, just being very cautious that way. Uh, and so we might as well go ahead and acknowledge that those concerns are different um, for women than, than for most men. Uh, when you're traveling and working in the field, um, so true, very true. Yeah, I I have been fortunate that professionally I haven't very often been the only woman, but where I do sometimes have some challenges that come up is that there are still societal expectations of women, and and occasionally those will bleed through, um, and I have to to point them out. So an example would be that I've talked about sick leave at my workplace mm -hmm. and, and what that means. And sometimes there has been an expectation of, of I, I remember saying something at one point of, well, my spouse might be homesick, but he's, he's okay, he can take care of himself. And I had a male colleague who was like, you wouldn't take care of him. And I looked at him and I said, you don't take off when your wife is sick, right? So it was this very interesting, <laughs> social pressure that I didn't expect. Um, we've had other instances where uh, my husband's an academic. We've had his colleagues over to the workplace and I've had his male colleague come up and thank me for the food. Um, when it's very clear in my house that if it's a special occasion, usually my husband's the one doing the cooking. And I had thought that this colleague knew this, but I'd, I've had to mention a few times to him saying, you need to go to my colleague and thank my husband, your colleague, and thank him for, for dinner because he's the one that made everything. But it's it's those kinds of places where sometimes I, I think there's an assumption that that we're, we're past gender issues, mm -hmm. but there's still societal expectations that kind of bleed in at different points. I feel like maybe either I was unlucky and like the other three people on the call, I definitely have seen some pretty egregious uh, blatant sexist behavior in faculty meetings and and the like. Um, it could be that it's a different perspective maybe I have as a Black woman, I don't know, but uh, certainly you have uh, a couple of choices when you're in, when you're confronted with that. Uh, mm -hmm. You can say something, interrupt the meeting and, and call it out. You cannot say something. Um, you can speak out if someone else, if the other women are being spoken mm -hmm. over or ignored. Um, uh, in the end, I think that's kind of the tactic that the women in the department and I did was we would say, well, this person's actually said that earlier. Thank you for repeating what so-and-so said. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes when the comments were, were really egregious, you know, about um, or of a sexual nature, which sometimes um, a former colleague used to, to say, we had to make the decision. Do you report it? Do you not report it? And those are things that are just burdensome and time consuming. <laughs> and they definitely take away from the fun part. Not that faculty meetings are very fun, but they could be fun, but that definitely makes them less fun. Um, and so I would say, you know, uh, it sure it happens. Um, and, and you should come up with a strategy uh, because 
uh, event, you know, it's, there's a non-zero chance that it would happen in your professional life. So you might want to think about what you would do in that scenario and what type of support you would need um, and kind of make a plan so that you're not caught off guard. Um, and, uh, I'm actually surprised. I'm actually surprised to hear that um, Michelle hasn't really experienced that much because she, even though I think she has been like this amazing leader over many years now to get more involvement of women in entomology and entomology society. And I thought, well, maybe this is driven from personal experience, but I so, you know, so happy that's for you, that's not the case, but also, and I feel the same way, this doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because we didn't experience it. And therefore maybe we should actually work extra hard to help those um, other people that are not that fortunate and, and educate ourselves. So that's really cool, and Michelle. I was gonna, and I was gonna jump in and, and, and say that, you know, while I, I personally haven't felt um, discriminated against or um, disrespected, I'm gonna say disrespected in a, in a professional setting with my, in my workplace. Um, it's really, really clear that something isn't right because <laughs> still, because the, um, the fact is that the, there are not enough women in leadership at my company. Um, in some, in some ways, you know, we're, we've actually taken a, a little bit of a step backwards in, in some ways, I think, uh, uh, COVID um, and the burdens of caregiving have taken some people out of the workplace um, that um, that maybe wouldn't have um, felt those pressures as acutely um, before. And it's it's clear that at ESA there's not equity at Corteva there's not equity. I mean, point to an industry. Um, an agriculture industry where there's equity. Um, and so it's, it's clearly, while it, it may not be um, obvious, it may not be explicit, there's, there's stuff going on that isn't, isn't right. And otherwise we would, there would be equity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If, uh, you know, if you could go back to your, to your younger selves, what, what advice would you give your younger self? Would, would, would there be anything that you would like to change? Or, or anybody who's starting new, somebody like me who is in, who's very early in our career, would you give us any advice about, you know, about conflict uh, resolution or, or anything? An advice that you would give your younger self and to the others? I would say trust yourself. That was what I, if I could go back a million times over, I would say trust yourself. You, you know, there, there, are, there were times in grad school, I can remember we, my mm -hmm. colleague, Jesse Lippman and Lauren Spearman and I, three women, we were working on a, a, a paper uh, and we found something that was like a surprise. Um, and my, our, our professors and collaborators all said, you must have done it wrong because you're students. There's no way that this could be right. And they had us kind of run these analysis over and over again for 12 months. And in the meantime, somebody else published a paper showing that that result was real. Um, and so I always say this to my colleagues and grad students, and I would say this to myself if I could go back in time, trust yourself. If you work hard and are intellectually rigorous with your data set, just because, you know, people make discoveries all the time, but I think maybe we're so, kind of socially conditioned to second guess ourselves. Don't second guess yourself, trust yourself. That's what I would say. Wonderful. Yeah, and, um, uh, and advocate for yourself. And also, if you can, advocate for those um, around you. In the end, it all will pay off. If, you, if you're a good colleague, um, on, at times when you need uh, your colleague's help, there, there's going to be somebody there to stand up for you and be an ally for you. So, true. I like, I like what you said um, about being yourself. Um, and certainly, Jessica, trusting yourself. Um, the, the other, the other thing I would say is, don't blame yourself. 
um, because so many people are going to be so willing to, to lay blame um, and don't accept that. Don't accept that blame and, and certainly don't, um, don't initiate uh, the blame uh, on yourself because it's not your fault. Um, and it's, it's, it's often um, you, you really are in a bad situation or you know, somebody else really did screw up and it's, it, it's not always your responsibility. True, that is true. We often sometimes just think that, oh, it has to be my fault or I did something wrong. Yes. And kind, and it's not always the case. Well, there's so many good things after, um, like these are, are excellent pieces of advice that I, I think is, is all true. Um, a piece that I, I still hold on to from, from somebody who gave it to me is that um, this is your life. Like, this is your life. And so you can, you can ask for decisions or you can ask for guidance from other people but at the end of it, you know, the person that I was seeking advice from, he told me, he said, you have to live with the consequences of it, right? You're going to have to live with, with the decision and, and what happens after this. So I, you have to make the decision that you can live with whatever that happens to be. Um, and uh, sometimes that's really unsatisfying to, to come into because you, you don't like any of the, the options in front of you, but they're, it, it's yours, right? It's your life that you're going to have to live with, even if um, even if you're in a situation that, that, uh, stinks for, for lack of a good word with that one. So the next question I had for you was, suppose you are given a magic wand, what would you do with it? Would you kind of like, you know, move it around and say that, all right, I, I'm going to switch my career. I don't want to be in entomology anymore. Or would you still choose entomology? And choose what, where you are right now, you know, like in your leadership roles. Well, I think I've liked every stage that I was in. So I would, it would be hard to choose. I mean, I like the, the stage that I'm in right now, but I also loved being um, a professor at a university. I loved being a postdoc. I loved grad school. So maybe uh, any, the wand could be used um, could the one be used to make to take you to like an to to like an alternative reality, but then you can still come back to the one that you're in? It's, it's, it's your magic, magic wand. wand. It's yours. It's yours. It's your magic wand. Yeah, if I could do that, then I would just temporarily I would want to go to the future uh, and see um, some cool genomics tricks and then bring them back to my lab. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would do. I would just so keep that's, everything that's the same. <laughs> that that is clever. I like that. Um, so I, I would like to, I think we're making great strides to make the, the field of entomology more uh, equitable, uh, definitely more diverse, but the next step is to make it more equitable. I'd like for us to, to get there a little bit faster, um, but that's the whole society is, is going through this. So, um, like the broader society is going through this. So that, that would be one thing. And the other thing would be the recognition of the general public and policymakers to see that insects and, and, and uh, insect science are incredibly important for public health, biodiversity, for um, food security, for technological advancements, which is my area of research and, and so on. So it would be nice to not have insects be maligned so much. So if I had a no, mind, Em. Oh, please go ahead, Michelle. Sorry, no, go ahead, Jennifer. I was, I was. Now I'm going to have to think of a new one because Em stole mine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's that's the the value of going going first. So maybe um maybe if I I go then um you'll you'll have something different. If I had a magic wand. Um, what I would like the most is for people to be better understand the lens that they're looking at the world through. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when we think about our career paths, we, we know what we came through and we don't necessarily see what it was like for somebody that was different than us. Um, and I mean that 
you know, I know my lens as a white woman. I don't know what my colleague who was a black man went through. And I don't know what my other colleagues have gone through. I would love to use my magic wand to make that happen. Cause I think that that would allow for a lot more empathy and understanding of why people are coming to decisions and, and to discussions from the, from the viewpoint that they are. And I hope that if I could do that, then I could also fix um, M's problem about policymakers. They'd all, all of a sudden understand just the beauty of insects and how much we need them to, to do everything. Oh, that's great. I, um, you know, science and, and entomology, it, it's been such a privilege to be able to spend my career um, doing this. Just a, a tremendous gift. Um, if I had a magic wand, I probably wouldn't change any of that, but I would wave it so that everybody who needs it has a champion or an ally, like I've been championed and, and have allies over the course of my career. And that I would hear zero stories from colleagues um, in private talking about the discrimination, the bias that they've faced, um, and, which is you know heartbreaking and just so, so unfair. Um, so that would, be, that would be my ideal um, is that, that, uh, that those stories just don't happen. True. And um, so, you know, hearing your perspectives, uh, what really comes through, what shines through is that you are true leaders. Even with a magic wand in hand, you're sort of still talking about progressing science. So you're talking about progressing the society or progressing how, how we look at the world and what can we do to make things better. So at what point in your entomology career did you decide to volunteer for ESA or volunteer for other leadership roles in ESA. So what 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 made that click? So when I started as a master's student, um, my major advisor at that time happened to be the program chair for his um, professional society, and so they brought the meeting to our our school in Athens. Um, and so it just always was that service was the third thing that you were supposed to do. You were supposed to train the next generation. You were supposed to do your research and then you're supposed to give back to the professional organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I got involved in ESA pretty early of, yeah, I can stand up and moderate a session and, and it's, it's progressed from there of um, people see that you, mm -hmm. um, you, you do what you say you're going to do and, and uh, then they ask you to come back and do other things. I, I have felt drawn to service, um, and uh, sorry about that, Jessica. Uh, I, I felt drawn to service um, from very early on, starting with uh, very uh, small small roles of of um, the service, uh, like a, a an awards committee or something like that. It was a, con a defined timeline, um, not a huge commitment, um, and it it grew from there. And one thing, a point that I'd like to make is that in order to run for office, it really took somebody coming and asking me. Um, and so I really encourage um, everybody to think about, you could be the person, right? That reaches out to someone else and says, I think you'd be a great leader. And so be that, right? Uh, reach out and, and encourage somebody else to run for an office um, if you think if you think they'd be well suited. That's what it took for me, and I think we all have the power to do that for someone else as well. I think that's really well put, Michelle. I wouldn't probably have run. I, I had moderated symposia, uh, organized symposia, moderated, uh, but I would never have really thought that I would have been valuable as a leader to the society. But somebody came up to me. Um, and said, hey, have you ever considered running? And I thought, oh, they must be talking to somebody else, you know, but no. So if, if that person hadn't said that to me, I probably wouldn't have considered running for first the section leadership um, and then for the governing board. So thanks uh, to the person who inspired me to run. Um, and I, I would just echo what Michelle said. I mean, there's a lot of examples of people who are enthusiastic and passionate um, but they just may not know that uh, there's a spot for them. 
uh, but there's actually spots for everybody. So you should uh, don't count yourself out. Don't vote yourself out. Yeah, and there's many different jobs within. So there's something that that, that is, is of interest to you. Like my passion is uh, um, science policy. We have those. We have you know organizing meetings or symposia. The volunteers for that. Um, yeah, and for me, it's it was really I I won an award as a graduate student, and one of the uh, things you had to do is go to the business meeting, which we don't really have anymore. Go to the business meeting of your section. And uh, that's where you accepted it. You had it was like a requirement you had to go. And all of a sudden, I was in this business meeting, and I think I already like volunteered for something there just because I had to show up. So I think that was a really we don't do that anymore. But um, and then and then the uh, and, and examples. My major advisor from the masters, Nancy Beckage, was very involved in what so was then Section B, now it's PBT. And then my major advisor for my PhD was Rob Niederman who eventually also became president so um, of the essay. So yeah, it's kind of, and I'm <laughs> passing it on now, my graduate students on the student council. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. So yeah. That's incredible. Do you have any advice to offer the ASA members if they want to pursue leadership roles, could start at a branch, could start with a section committee, but is there any advice? How, how can they do this? I would say that all road, you know, there's this expression that all roads lead to Rome. Like you can, you can start anywhere. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's, I had this idea that maybe there was this hierarchy, like first you do student, then you do ECP, mm -hmm. but no, you can actually at any, at, from you can enter from any door really. Um, and if you're curious or you have questions about the different committees, the website actually has a nice kind of description of all the different committees, often the chair, of uh, those committees are happy to talk to you about, um, you know, what the what the positions are and what the committee entails. You can also reach out to headquarters staff, and they have a lot of information. Rosina Romano does kind of membership coordination, and she can give you insight into the different um, uh, committees. And there are staff liaison on each committee too. So you can also reach out to headquarters staff and they can tell you about the different committees if you wanna do committee work. Um, if you wanna do section work, you can speak to your section uh, um, representatives. And I'm sure they would say, at least for systematic biology, they would say, you wanna volunteer? <laughs> Come on, because they would be so excited, thrilled really uh, for you to wanna participate. Mm -hmm. And, and and do and do something that you want to do, right? Like you don't don't say, oh, I have to go through this really boring committee that I'm not really interested in. Uh, don't start there. Do something you really like and you're comfortable with, and then yeah. As as somebody who is relatively recent in the U.S. Uh, in ESA, I can definitely attest to that. Um, you know, I mean. ESA has been very welcoming. And there are so many opportunities that all of us can definitely uh, take advantage of. Uh, is, there, is there something that, that excites you about what you do? You know, what, what are you most proud of? Uh, I, I know it's, it's a long, illustrious career for quite a, quite a lot of you, but is, is there something that you're really proud of, something uh, in, in your career that you think shines the brightest? Who's first? <laughs> so one of my not paid roles <laughs> has been working <laughs> for the Mosquito Vector Control Association mm -hmm. in California. And I've done um, a period of time where I was one of the chairs of their committees for regulatory affairs. And what that meant was that we were working as an association to interact with groups like the State Water Resources Control Board or the Department of Pesticide Regulation um, or others that were dealing with with regulations that would then impact our work mm -hmm. and we found out um, from the work of some of our our colleagues that uh, the state water resources control board when they put in this regulation that they wanted no trash to enter the streams and rivers of california that they were solving that through the the cities um, by having them install things that then made our work as mosquito control professionals harder um, it was really tough for us then to do a lot of the things that we would normally do 
And we ended up spending about two years in discussions with the State Water Resources Control Board and the cities that were going to have to put in the devices and the manufacturers of those devices and then mosquito control professionals across the state to figure out a new system of going through all these devices and, and figuring out what was going to work best. And one of the pieces that was sometimes hard for folks with that um, is to remember who wasn't in the room with us. So mosquito control has big agencies where um, some of us have the time to devote over to things like this, and I'm fortunate to be at one of those. But we also have some really small agencies that, that aren't in the room. And I think in that whole process of, of learning what was going on, I've really tried to hold on to remembering who's not in the room with me when we're making decisions so that I can seek out those voices and get that input, whether it's it's issues at ESA or, or issues with mosquito control, just trying to remember who's not in the room um, and, and trying to work on them, those projects together. What does it say about us that sometimes we struggle um, with identifying what we're proud of? <laughs> it just None means of us done incredible stuff. <laughs> it says that we're not done yet. That's what I keep thinking about. That's yeah. like we're just not done yet. Exactly. I wanted to ask you this question for quite some time since we started this. What is the last insect that you ate? That I ate? Yes, that you ate. I, I never consciously ate an insect. I'm sure I did, but uh, I mean, you know, like. But don't we all? Okay. Next, <laughs> next, next governing, next governing board meeting. I, I, it's scorpion. Yeah. So that's it. You mean like the scorpions that come in those candies? No, it was actually scorpion at like when when I was in China. Yeah, fried scorpion. But um, I've never had oh. an insect. We we actually have like you know here at Illinois Insect Fear Film Festival and all that stuff. <laughs> And, uh, but that's one of the things that's not allowed. We're not allowed to have, um, because there's, the, the, you know, uh, the fear of um, allergies and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I've never. Yeah. We had a really big uh, cicada emergence this uh, past mm -hmm. summer. And so my students and I, we went and we collected a bunch um, and we brought them back here. Uh, we were gonna put them in the museum collection, but then some we saved and we sauteed them, we fricasseed them with some onions and garlic, um, and we put them on our hamburgers. I had a veggie burger with cicadas. I had nymphs and adults. Um, I didn't cut the wings off or anything. I just had them seasoned. I made a garlic uh, rosemary aioli, and um, Joseph Yoon, who has this edible insect um, company called Brooklyn Bugs, he had come over because he was going to um, be collecting with us, but he ended up showing a little bit late after we'd finished collecting, which was terrible because this is like a professional chef. And then he saw the way that I was cooking and I felt like I wasn't a very good chef and mine didn't look very pretty, but it was delicious. Uh, but it was, you know, very basic, like a hamburger with just like insects kind of on drizzled on top uh, mm. with this uh, mayonnaise -y, uh, thing. And it was really yummy. But he said, are you going to season that? And I thought, uh oh, the chef is telling me, am I going to season that? That probably means I haven't seasoned this properly. Because <laughs> I don't think I'm a good cook, but they ate it anyways, and they liked it. Wings and all. Mm -hmm. That sounds delicious, Jessica. I, mine had been more simple, just uh, some fried up mealworms. Um, and I don't remember if it would, that was the most recent, um, tasted a lot like popcorn, I guess, or uh, prepackaged um, cricket flour cookies. Cookies are always good. I think my yeah. most recent is probably prepackaged pre mealworms. Um, I think one of the best ones was uh, at Riverside, UC Riverside. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the faculty members pulled out Manduca Sexta and fried them um, fresh, and that it. it tasted, you know, just like any other fried thing. But wait, it was huge and fat. It was, um, it was Mike Adams did this. Oh, so, so I don't, uh, so we tried that, like that, the Manduka challenge, like, you know, uh, okay. when I was an undergrad, oh no, when I was a grad student at Riverside, 
but at a certain point you you feed them uh, artificial diet which has like fungicide and, and things like that so i did you know we were like mm, we would have to feed them on probably tomato plants before you can serve them but i guess that you know mike maybe didn't care <laughs> so. i'll admit it's long enough ago i didn't i can't remember if i asked what they were eating beforehand right, right. i had one or okay. two and we I'm used to okay. breed, we used to breed wax moth caterpillars and the mm -hmm. diet we used was uh pablum and honey uh so it smelled so good and they tasted really really good uh, and the whole house smelled like pablum and honey but then when uh i worked in entomopathogenic nematodes we also used galeria for those and they were not bred on on honey and pablum and now whenever i see them all i can smell is that cadaver smell after they had the nematodes in them and I'm off them. Like, so if any, if they're ever in a cookie, doesn't matter how they were weird. All I can see is like the pathogenic nematodes bursting out of them. And oh I, no. I, I oh my even, God. Oh. My, my brain is like, has a thing that associates it with that. <laughs> well, switching gear then, something that you like, what's your favorite insect? Too hard, too hard to say. I'm a huge fan of termites. I, I find uh, so their their uh, social nature really fascinating. Um, their diversity um, and the there's endless things to learn from termites and about termites. Also, they are very powerful for their size. Right? They can they uh, working together. They really accomplish a lot. True. I'll vote for termites also, uh, although an obvious answer would be dragonflies, but um, I really like um, music. I like playing music and listening to music. And people have done studies with termites that uh, they work faster when heavy metal or punk rock music is played. And I feel like I associate with that. So I'll give another vote, another plus one for termites. Uh, I'm still in love with aquatic insects, just as a whole group, and that that is, I can't pick just one. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> you just give me aquatic insects, and I'm I'm the happiest of campers. Yeah, I I, I fell in love with Bacchanid wasps, and they made made me an entomologist. Um, but now I work on click beetles and cicadas and I just I'm so fortunate I just love those guys too I'm gonna start working on dragonflies and always still want to do those exploding termites so maybe someday go to Guyana <laughs> I'll meet you at the airport in five. <laughs> oh Michelle Michelle you're muted have, have any of you seen the synchronized fireflies that's that's on my bucket list have you seen them? No, we should add uh, for an ESA member and former uh, lab mm -hmm. mate, uh, Will Kuhn is at Discover Life in America in the Smokies. And they have a like a supper where you go, like you can buy a ticket and you go and have, have the supper and then they take you to see the synchronized fireflies. Maybe we should wow. go on a, that should have been a, a fun trip that we, the four of us, or you too, Priya, or you too, Joey, love to. should go and do it. <laughs> it sounds like a we did, um, my husband and I got a chance to go to New Zealand and we definitely had to go make a stop to see the glow worms in the, in the caves. And that was um, really impressive to be able to, to see that. So it was nice to have, you know, a, a supportive um, spouse who's like, oh, you want to go see insects? I'm like, yes, I want to go see insects. That's amazing. So they were so cool and so fun to be in the dark and look at all the cool things that they're doing. Is there, is that your, like on the, of the bucket list of things you want to see is synchronized fireflies at the top? Are there other ones, Michelle or Jennifer or Mariana or Priya? Are there other ones that are like must see before your career ends? Glow worms is definitely on my list. I, I came across this picture a friend had posted. I mean, she couldn't take pictures inside that cave. So she kind of bought a postcard and she was like, this is what it looks like. And she shared it with me and I was like, are you for real? And I was like, oh my God, I got to go see it. But it's New Zealand. Sunday, Sunday, it's in my bucket list. 
I think the fireflies are are high on my bucket list now. That's um, definitely one that I want to go see. I I had seen a lot of fireflies growing up as a kid in India. And I don't remember seeing anything for at least 15, 20 years till I moved here. And then I went to uh, one of the field sites close by. And that was incredible seeing it in late summer. And I was like, what is that? Then I realized it's a firefly. And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot what they looked like in all these years living in big cities. And gosh, fireflies synchronized. Yes, please. Next presidential retreat. Smoky. I also I also haven't seen the um, the monarch migration, um, so I'd like I, that would be pretty impressive to see that. Come come visit. I'll I'll show you some California spots. You can at least see the the Pacific ones. I will do that. <laughs> well, looks like we are at eleven, and we managed to cover almost all of the questions on our list. Thank you so much for uh, doing this with us today. Thank you for sharing your stories, your advice, your, uh, your challenges, your ups, your downs, and everything about entomology, ESA leadership, being a woman, and being a scientist. We, we can only hope to inspire our next, our next line of leaders and our next line of uh, volunteers at ESA. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Priya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.